Thank you for that very appropriate song uh, this morning. This week has been quite a, a troubling week in many, many ways. And uh, as I have uh, looked forward to celebrating this uh, new season, the season of Pentecost, which begins today, Pentecost Sunday, uh, this is a, a time of celebration, and yet it's also a time for us where we recognize our great need of the Holy Spirit. That's been a week of deep irony in some ways. Last night at about 11.30 in the evening, we, uh, boys and Alex and I, we were looking at the stars and watching the sky and just waiting to see if we could catch a glimpse of the uh, SpaceX capsule you know, skipping across the heavens. And uh, it was somewhere around 11.30. I don't know, did anyone else see it? All right, you were all asleep by then. Uh, about 11.30 uh, last night, suddenly just as, uh, I mean, just as bright as could be, I mean, you couldn't miss it if you were looking up. Uh, a brilliantly bright object went racing across the sky at 17,000 miles an hour and was visible for about 15 seconds and then just like that disappeared as it went out of the sun's light. Just a few days earlier, we read or even watched the senseless killing of a black man in the corner of Chicago Avenue and 35th to 36th Street in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota by a law enforcement officer, an officer of justice. And that coupled with you know, the launch of these two Americans who are uh, shortly going to be connecting 250 miles above us to the International Space Station, those two stories stand in ironic contrast in many ways. Uh, one invokes, or provokes, I should say, uh, emotions of, of anger and frustration, and we're seeing that, right, on streets. Last night, three were killed on the streets of Indianapolis, uh, right, just south of us, and fires continue to be lit, and demonstrators continue to take to the streets, and all in a, in a, a with a great sense of, of injustice and need for something to be done, not just about George Floyd, but about the systemic injustices in our world. While 250 miles above are, I don't know, the two astronauts plus whoever else is in the space station, uh, floating around in the vast, uh, vast space above us, seemingly undisturbed, untouched by what's happening under the darkness of night in the streets of our cities. Two very different experiences of human life and existence. And as I, as I contemplate that, one provokes anger, the other, you know, looking upwards and seeing that capsule, and it's amazing, a capsule that's not that large. Uh, I, I'm not sure how large it is, but not larger than this room. And yet, you know, nearly 200 miles above us can just shine so brightly, and it, and it provokes a sense of awe. But not only that, but they represent, those two stories represent two different angles of humanity. You'd have a very different experience if you were downtown Minneapolis or Indianapolis or Houston or Los Angeles or any of our large cities. You'd have a very different experience of what it means to be human as you would experience uh, sentiments of, of grief and anger and injustice and people ready to take uh, this world under their own control if the people that we entrust with justice can't seem to get it right and seem to get it wrong and seem to be senseless in this case of a, a the, the killing of of a, a man who was who was clearly within their control 
juxtaposed to, to those who are hundreds of miles into space uh, doing, uh, representing the, the ingenuity and uh, the, the amazing uh, abilities and the best of humanity, being able to explore and to conduct all sorts of experiments in, in space. While in this universe, which is vast beyond our imaginations, I, I can, I, I always, when I look up at the stars and I, and I, last night, I imagine, I wonder what those two, uh, Doug and Bob, I think are their names, is that correct? I, I imagine, what, what are they looking at right now? What are they seeing? They're seeing the blue planet. They're seeing, uh, they're seeing the sun as they go around the world in 90 minutes, right? Uh, it's, it's amazing uh, to, to think about what are they watching? What are they seeing? And it's, it's hard to imagine without being there. You, know, you see pictures and so forth. But my mind always imagines it must be something like, like when, when, I see, uh, when I see an ant hill and I see ants running all over that hill, each doing their work and, and uh, each you know, carrying their load and they seem to be cooperating. And, and, then, and, and, and I hear there are ant wars. I've never watched an ant war, but uh, that there are, what do you call a, a group of ants? Not a herd, not a flock, but whatever. A colony, oh, that, that fits. A colony of, of ants that will fiercely protect their anthill, their territory. And I think, you know, here we are humans, each of us violently sometimes protecting our little speck of dust. You know, I am one of seven and a half billion people on this little ball of dust that is one of thousands, millions probably, probably billions of bodies within the heavens. How small I am. How vast the universe is. And, I, and then I think this, though, I think, what's God's perspective? Does God, is, is he always seeing things from the perspective of Bob and Doug up there? Always the big picture? Is, he all, is that all God sees, just, just the big picture, just all the, the vastness of the universe and the awesome wonder of, of his creation? Or is God down on the city streets, and is he seeing things from, to put it in Google's terminology, from street view? Right? I don't know. You, do you ever, you ever wonder those kinds of things? And my mind this week, as I wrote one sermon and then another, and I brought them all with me on four different pieces of paper, and this one doesn't reflect any of them very well. Uh, my mind actually went uh, to Habakkuk. It turned to Habakkuk, would you? If you have a Bible like mine, it's on page 1018. Uh, but or 1019 in the Old Testament, but uh, Habakkuk turned there with me because my, uh, my this this question I asked myself: God, how do you see the world? Are you seeing it from from that that big picture perspective, or are you seeing it from the street view? And of course, we know that God sees it from both directions, right? He sees both perspectives and everything in between. But I, I'm reminded of Habakkuk the prophet, and in this little, uh, little prophetic book that we very often just kind of forget about, he, he expresses something that ought to be our expression today as well. He begins in verse 2. He says, Oh, Lord, how long? Now, now I'm going to read these verses. But follow with me. How fitting are these verses for our day today? Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make us see iniquity, and why does it seem? Now, you understand the prophet here. Why does it seem? He's speaking to God. Why does it seem, God, that you are idly looking at wrong? 
destruction and violence, riots and fires and murders and killing, all sorts of things are taking place before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed. Wow. Have you seen pictures of what's happening this week? The law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Wow, what a description of what we're experiencing in our world. Something as simple, all right, this is really, really simple. I, I think some of us were talking about this. I may have shared this earlier this week. Very, very simple. I, little things sometimes annoy me. I'm walking out of Walmart. How many have followed all of the directional signs in Walmart? Are you very, very, anyone very careful about that? Okay, well, I'm, I'm somewhat careful. And... Uh, I'm very careful that everybody else does that, all right? Uh, but I, I, I'm walking out, I, you know, I walk all the way around these barriers, take you out 100 feet out this way, and you're the only one going in, but you still got to go that way and come back in. You walk through the entrance, and you get your cart and all that stuff. And so here I am. I'm finished. I just went in and got one thing, and I'm walking back out the exit, and here comes, here comes a man who is perfectly fit and able to to walk around if he wanted to and he decides he wants to go in through the exit it's a lot shorter now the truth is he's probably just smarter than i am but uh, he decides to take a shortcut and so i stop from about here to the altar i see him coming in and i think okay well proper social distance i'll just let him go ahead and go through and so i stopped and i didn't say anything didn't frown at him didn't say anything but he he got the hint he's like ah it's shorter and I just kind of smiled and walked on. I was a little bit annoyed that I hadn't thought about it, but nonetheless, a little bit annoyed that, that my thought walking then out the exit is, that's really interesting. Like, I had a sense when I came in, I was justifying myself here and, and kind of patting myself on the back, thinking, you know, I had a sense that the sign said, do not enter here and go around and enter here. And so I had a sense of, all right, Walmart wants me to do that. So I did it. And the thought that came to my mind when this fellow came through the exit, entered through the exit, was, is there just now a general sense so that we can just ignore the directions that people give us? Is there just a sense now that signs that say do not enter don't matter anymore? Is there a sense that, uh, you know, the authorities, whether it's Walmart, who makes rules for their property, or, or our city government, or anyone else, that we just don't have to listen. We can just do it the way we want to. And then I started thinking, well, it wasn't that way when I was a kid. But then I started thinking a little more deeply, and I thought, well, actually, it probably was. But it makes me wonder, as a culture, are we, are we becoming insensitized to injustice? Are we becoming insensitized to the little things until suddenly something blows up and we think, oh, well, that's way beyond what we ought to tolerate? The senseless killing of a black man on the streets of Minneapolis. That's, clearly, that's way beyond what we ought. But where does that start? Where does it start? And the prophet is saying, Lord, how long? How long will you stand seemingly with a blind eye towards what's happening on the street view? So what he's saying is, God, why are you only staying out there in space with Bob and Doug while we're down here on the streets having to deal with some real destruction and violence? And God answers in verses 5 and the following. He says, look among the nations, Hab Habakkuk, and see wonder and be astounded for I'm I am doing a work I am doing something let me tell you what I'm doing let me just touch on the key verses here he says first of all I'm raising up the Chaldeans I'm raising up your enemy the enemy of Israel the Babylonians I'm raising them up they are a bit bitter and a hasty nation they have, they're filled with all sorts of injustices they're not righteous people understand and I'm ra I'm I'm raising them up and he says, they're dreaded, verse 7, they're dreaded, they're fearsome, their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. In other words, they don't pay attention to what God has revealed to be just, they just make it up themselves, right? That sounds like our world, does it not? Take justice into your own hands, and I'm just going to try to be more powerful than you are and try for my sense of justice to prevail against your sense of justice. So that's uh, clashing, right? And, and God says, but I'm doing something in this. He says, 
he says they're gonna they're going to appear to be winning for for a time to come habakkuk he says in verse 11 they sweep by like the wind and they go on but they are guilty men whose own might is their god so habakkuk he he responds to god he responds with a complaint as you can imagine he says but wait a second god what do you mean i i I asked you, my question to you is, why do you seem to be so far away when there's so much injustice going on in this world? Again, why do you seem to be seeing things from Bob and Doug's perspective when we need you to be seeing things from a street view? He says, Aren't you a, how can you, a God of justice, allow someone as unjust as the Babylonians to be a servant of your justice? Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? Verse 12, he responds, Habakkuk responding to God, O Lord, you have ordained them as judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. Well, you are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. So he's calling, he's calling God's plan into question. He's saying, God, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I don't understand how that's just. I know that you're just. I know that you're righteous, but I, that, it, it's not making sense to me. Verse 14, he says, You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. Now he's speaking of Babylonian, uh, Babylon now. He says, He brings them all up with a hook. He's, Babylon is like a, a, a fisherman with a hook or, or with a net. He drags out the net and he's pulling up the fish of the sea. That's the rest of us. All right? So this unjust nation is gathering the rest of the world into their dragnet and then rejoicing and boasting and is, is happy in their heart. Uh, therefore, he sacrifices to his nets. He, he attributes his, his power and his conquering over all the nations to his own ability to be a good fisherman. He offers sacrifices to his net. He makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. He thinks he has served himself. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? God, oh, and so then this is what Habakkuk does in his final response to chapter 2. He says, I am going to go, God, you said you're working. You said you're doing something earlier in that chapter. You said you're doing something, so here's what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to stand, I'm going to go to the watch post. I'm going to go to the watchtower in the city, and I'm going to set myself down, and I'm just going to see what you do. That's what Habakkuk says. I'm going to go up there, and I'm going to wait for you to answer my complaint. So God answers. He says, write this down. I'm going to give you a vision. So he gives him a vision. In that vision, he says, most famously in verse 4, he says, behold, his soul is puffed up. Speaking of Babylon, it's not upright within him, but this is happening in order to show that the righteous live by faith. In other words, the righteous believe that God is and always will be a God of justice and a God of mercy. Then he says, here's what's going to happen to Babylon. Beginning in verse 6, he says, Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and rills for him and say, Now look, look at the woes here. In verse, first of all, in verse 6, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own takes what is not his well, that's been happening a lot this week has it not takes what doesn't belong to them makes oh he says they're just loading up for themselves they're loading up them for themselves punishment destruction they've plundered but it's all going to come back to them look at verse 9 woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high and thinks that he he's beyond he, he's untouchable he's untouchable as, as Nebuchadnezzar thought he was. And the Babylonians thought they were. They're like an eagle sitting high in their nest. 
They think they're untouchable, but he says they're going to come crashing down. Their walls of stone can be destroyed. He says they will cry out from the wall. The beam from the woodwork will respond in verse 11. Another woe in verse 12. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. They, they've come to power through, through their murderous ways, but it's all going to come back upon them. And then in verse 14, he says, that after it all comes back upon them, he says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what God is working. He is working so that the world sees his Glory. Another woe in verse 15. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. The Babylonians, of course, were, were notorious for stripping their, their prisoners naked and marching them bound in chains, lined cha by link to link, long lines of prisoners and marching them out, embarrassing them and humiliating them in front of their own townspeople and marching them off to prison in some far off place. He says, woe to them. Woe to them, because the ones who have caused shame will be shamed. Then he says in verse 18 and 19, the final woe has to do with idolatry. What profits an idol when its maker has shaped it? He says in verse 19, woe to him who says to a wooden thing something of their own cre uh, creation. Verse 18, he says, for its maker trusts in his own creation. He says, woe unto them. Woe unto them who make gods of, of their own, or in other words, who take justice into their own hands instead of looking to God. So Habakkuk, he ends with a prayer. In chapter 3, he ends with a prayer. It's a, a prayer that's worth our attention, but for sake of time, I want to go to to the end. In that prayer... Though he does, he, he, he sees it, it's really a vision that God gives to him. And he, he talks about, he describes how nature itself is going to respond when God comes in justice and in judgment. But look here, let's read the last three verses of chapter 3. He says, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no fruit. In other words, even if nature itself were to stop doing what they were created to do, there'd be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. Now listen to this. You know this verse. He makes my feet like the deer's. And he makes me tread on high places. Let me, I'm going to end with this. Because that phrase stood out to me. When all, when the world is surrounded, again, from the street view, there's incredible injustice going on. Habakkuk wants God to do something about it. He doesn't like God's plan. But he says, God, let my feet tread on high places. Take me, take me to the mountain. Take me to the place where I can rise above my petty little view and I can stand and I can see things from your perspective because there are two things that happen from there. First of all, God, when I'm on your mountain, I'm safe. There's safety there. There's safety because you know that that's where God meets his prophet over and over and over in that, in that place and, and that mountain where God has faithfully met his people. I'm going to put myself, God, in the, in the place where I know you meet your people. And then he says, when I'm in that place, then I will begin to see things not from my only, not, not from my own selfish point of view where I'm fiercely guarding my own territory and seeing all the injustices done to me, but I am going to be able to see things from your perspective. So God, give me that perspective. And can I tell you something? I think that's what the church needs to do today. I think we need to return to the place where we know God meets his people. And then I think we need to ask him for, to, to be able to see things from his perspective. You see, God does see things from the perspective of Doug and Bob, but he sees the street view as well. Our problem is, is we can only see one or the other at a single time right? 
We seem to be only see what we are feeling and what's immediate upon us, but God sees all things, and we can trust Him, and the just live by faith. And the good news is that by the Holy Spirit coming, He has invited us to come to the place where God can give perspective and where He can give safety. I'm going to ask, Miss Heidi, would you sing that second verse of the song that you sang? And let's listen to the words as we bring this service to a close. Let's listen to the words and let's let this be our prayer. God, that we are your church and let us be, let us be perspective givers in a, in a gracious, in a gracious, kind way. Make, it requires us to have that perspective first. So you're going to sing this song and then we're going to have our benediction today. <laughs>